This is Duke University. Okay, and can I have the high slides down for this? Because what I'd like to do is, um, I'm going to play two trailers of upcoming, well, upcoming games, but they're kind of franchise games. One from Epic Games, my caps, and the other from Bioware EA. So here's the first one. Oh, that's really dark. Lights all the way down? Oh, that's the other way. Let me go back. A lot more touching in the dark. That's right. And Numero dos, I hope. Two million dead in the first day. Another seven million by the end of the first week. Every defense annihilated. All our forces on the run. Regrouping somewhere. Reports are coming in from other major cities. It's a well-coordinated attack. And so far it's been damned effective. Don't know what they are, what they want, or where they came from. Only one thing is certain. If Shepard doesn't bring help soon, left to save. Okay. We can bring the lights up now. So, I'm really excited about this because uh, I spent four years studying all this immersive stuff and uh, Brett is my world's best friend and we worked together for many, many years. Um, and, and Mike, I saw deliver a talk at, uh, I guess it was a games conference two years ago, uh, about just your role as CEO in managing incredibly creative people who can kick this kind of stuff out. But you better hit your cycle. You gotta hit the dates. And it just really struck me in, in the world of management, it's what Robin was just talking about is creative genius on a schedule. And I had the opportunity to go up to EA and we're you know, walking around the Need for Speed guys and we're walking around the skateboard one. And even the architecture is like, in the architecture of the place is the project plan. So the artifacts are there. If you're a cultural anthropologist, you can see that time matters. But there's also, you know, the margarita bar in the corner. And, the, you know, it's, it's just this, this, this really interesting mix. So a couple of things I want to get, and we're going conversationally here. We're going off program. And I'm in HR, so I know nothing about the margarita bar. <laughs> <laughs> so don't ask, don't tell policy as it pertains to margarita bars and beer fridges. No. Just so we'll here, leave it at that. So here's how it works with these guys. Right? I, when I sent out the note about PowerPoint, and can you send your PowerPoint, Brett responds, PowerPoint? I thought Mike was bringing sock puppets and we were doing improv. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm also from If it gets bar, bad, I do have socks. I'm not. So. <laughs> this is cool. But I want to first, let's level set. 
you know, games. Howard's data, when you looked on the consumer side, a lot of money being chucked out for games. But we all know games, you know, that can be a couple of minutes on Farmville or Cityville all the way to 30 to 35 hours trying to get to level whatever on whichever MMO you want. So it's, it's a very broad spectrum. So it might suffer a little bit from kitchen sickness. But is it fair to say that games, as people in the industry, are a very growing phenomenon, that it's a big, um, big deal? Let's kind of say, you know, every, people come out and say, oh, it's bigger than Hollywood, this, that, and the other. We're Where, bigger than God, was, sir. We're bigger than God. Bigger than God, yes. okay. There, uh, there's, there's a leap of faith. I mean, it really depends who you talk to about the games industry right now. Um, there's a lot of money coming into it. Not a lot of it's going to the people who make the games right now. A lot in going into advertising, and some of that's trickling to the developers. But you see a massive impact of piracy. It's been going on forever in games, but it's getting worse and worse. It's starting to happen in the console space. Uh, second sales are, uh, have been more and more painful as people are realizing how much more money they can make retailers by selling a used copy of a game and not giving any cut to the publisher or the developer. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good business model, right? If you have content and you repackage it, which is, of course, happening in media as well, right? You immediately scoop someone else's story and packages your own. You don't have to create content. It's a really easy business to be in if you can find a way to sustain it. And uh, so all the major retailers and games are realizing that now Amazon and Best Buy and other uh, big box retailers are starting to sell games used because, hey, why pay the game developers anything? So what you're seeing is game developers having a lot of trouble. Uh, stock for major game companies going down, game companies, independent companies going out of business, but more money coming into games because more people are identifying themselves as gamers, which is great. I love the fact that there's this the biggest, most active demographic of gamers right now. I've Depends who you ask, what are 30 to 45 year old women, which is awesome. Those are people who weren't gamers before. But they're not paying most game developers any, any actual money, yeah. so it's tough business. Mm -hmm. and, and real changes in the, uh, I mean, the established gaming business is the console business, right? Mm -hmm. And that's historically been a, been a packaged good play. So you're making a disc that you then plug into a console or, or machine. We're seeing a real evolution in that regard, and, and Mike and I were talking about this, I, mean, I think we both agree. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when the network is the platform. Mm. Um, and those consoles become somewhat obsolete because you're gonna be able to plug and play from home, you're gonna be able to access things through mobile devices, et cetera. The other thing I would mention, just to give a little more context around gaming, and we've really seen this the last two, three years, fewer, bigger hits. Mm -hmm. Way more risk, because that does not mean a diverse portfolio. You're, you're really laying it on the line on a small number of bets. I mean, EA's big competitor in the market, or one of the big competitors is Activision Blizzard. If you look at that company, they've got two big bets. Call of Duty, which sells a bushel, like north of 20 million units, and World of Warcraft, which paints a bit of a picture in terms of you know, where some of the industry is going. World of Warcraft is an MMO, massively multiplayer online game, and a phenomenal revenue stream that they love and that the analysts love, because mm -hmm. uh, you know, more than happy to take down that credit card and uh, run it as a, as a subscription service. So the model on that, for those of you, how many are Warcrafters or MMO type players? So you you go to Best Hundreds Buy. Hundreds of people at home just raise their hand. We That's just, right. It's back there. <laughs> you're, you're the equivalent of the three people who watch this, TV. This, right? this needs we to be got, two ways. They need to be asking us questions. That's right. I'll, I'll give you his email address and you can send. <laughs> he, he, he's on. Anyway, yeah. chat. I was going to say chatter. But. Okay, so, so the model is something like this. You go and you pay 50 bucks to buy the game. You slap it into your machine. You get into it. And then you pay a subscription on an ongoing basis. So just when I was doing research years ago, uh, EverQuest, which was one that Sony, was John Sleep? No. Ever, EverQuest, they built it and then they kind of let it go fallow for a little while because Rafe left and uh, there's still 250,000 people knocking around on this thing, still spending at that time. I can't remember what it was. That's not a bad business model. It, you know, you just got to keep the servers up. There's no creative work going on. So, so, in a way, games are interesting because a lot of the same issues that we just talked about are there. But there's also some variability in, in you know, how, this is, how this is being managed. And that's, that's another thing I want to get to. But a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of the same issues around revenue models as well. Because yeah. you know, we've talked about the packaged good, we've talked about the subscription. Hey, the other play, and you especially see this in casual games, we call it MTX, micro, microtransactions, mm -hmm. which you know, kind of like your iPhone yeah. model. 
Yeah, and that's one of the scary things for us in the games industry right now is uh, people are talking about content being free and people having an expectation for free good content, which is really a little crazy. But right now it's holding up. Um, in the game space, 99 cents is something that you expect to be able to spend on a really good video game that you play for 10 hours. Um, so you can get lucky and make one of those with two guys in a garage for a month, and you know, or Angry Birds, which was a very small development budget, and they've made bajillions of dollars. But uh, that's the lucky. The the norm is not that. I mean, in, in my business, we spend 15, 20 million dollars in development costs alone, and probably double that marketing a strong game. And we can't sustain 99 cents a game. But mm -hmm. that's what people are starting to expect, and they're getting into the space of, it's 99 cents, I don't even think about it, I just push a button and I buy it and we can't sustain Blockbuster any more than we can sustain Blockbuster movies on 99 cents with no purchase and no in rentals without fees going back to the developer. You see the same thing in games. So let's get into just a little bit, I mean, we went into value chain on, on kind of media in general, but just like get into some of the nuances on games. So, so Mike, you got Epic, so you got an engine, mm -hmm. right, that other people use to develop. A very good stuff. engine. Oh, yeah. thanks. In fact, <laughs> Mass Effect uses our technology. Yeah. So we're, we're a technology company at Epic as well as a video game um, game maker, or whatever, um, which I think is the secret to us remaining independent for about 20 years. Most of the large independent game companies have been purchased by EA or Activision or other large publishers or just gone out of business because, uh, as you just said, we're in a hits business and there's three hits every Christmas, three guys who make their money back and about 40, 50 major titles that all lost money. And generally, if you're an independent developer, that means you go out of business or uh, your evil partners take more money, take you know more money out of it, or the evil publisher buys you, or whatever else. EA no longer evil, by the way. About five years ago, they flipped. So I joined EA five years yeah, ago. Oh, interesting, no. interesting. Could well done, Obi Wan. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we make technology as well, and having that revenue stream, additionally of making middleware and helping other game companies make their games faster, has been what always keeps us afloat, even if we have a bad game. Luckily, knock on my holla head, we haven't had any of those in a while. Uh, but that gives us the stability that most game companies don't have. Yeah. So this and, goes back to just five, what Jim five, was talking ten, about. five ten years ago. A million seller was pretty big in, mm -hmm. in video games. These days, a, a video game that sells a million ain't gonna be making money and as a rule. And the reason is, uh, in my first job in the games industry was selling video games in the mall, and it's 60 bucks for a video game, and two, maybe three guys worked on it for maybe six months. And now, video games sell for 60 bucks, but it cost about 200 guys about two, two and a half years to do that same project, and more money was spent on marketing than the development. Mm -hmm. And so that, and that's really rapid. You know, that million units was a good game, was four or five years ago. That's because we've more than doubled the average budget on games in the last five years. And that's huge. And it's because people expect these kind of visuals and this level of story and 60 hours of gameplay and everything else. We compete in biggerness, which is a really, really dumb way to compete in entertainment is, oh yeah, it's got 900 hours of gameplay. You'll never see them, but by God, you feel cheated if you don't have it in there somewhere. <laughs> So this can be, I mean, the, my mind goes I should to get out of this business. This is yeah. a terrible yeah. business. It's sounding terrible. What the hell am I doing? <laughs> I'm going to take you to the bar or something. We like have that. a margarita machine. <laughs> <laughs> Ding. And we are nimble. We actually do also have a margarita machine. That's really amazing. Ah. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's talk about those a little bit. So, so um, cause I've, I've, I haven't been to your shop, but we've talked a lot and I've been to your shop. And, and this, the thing that's interesting to me in a, how do you lead in a context of high creativity with critical deadline, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we've talked about this a little bit too. So, so there's a couple of principles you had that I thought were real cool about things like Jello and Pop Tarts and stuff. Could you could you riff on a couple of <laughs> Jello those? Jello and Pop Tarts. Well, I can see a book tarts. emerging. It's, you know, it's all about book. food for me. It's all about food. Yeah, and margaritas. Uh, well, I mean, the challenge for us at Epic is that, we, and the fun thing about working in the games industry and why I, I won't leave until I have to, is that you're with really, really creative artists and really brilliant programmers. Um, our company is maybe, we were 600 just worldwide, about 150 in Raleigh, and of that, 10 or administrative or business staff. Everybody else is a creative. Mm -hmm. And so you walk in there every day, it's really energizing, but if you're there at 11 o'clock, there's nobody there. All right, so it's a really strange environment of sort of lost boys, we call them, at the office who, you know, they don't quite know how to do laundry, but my God, they're brilliant, right? <laughs> weird combination. 
So a lot slide of a piece of cheese underneath exactly, the door. Exactly. <laughs> Flat every couple hours. Good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so keeping them happy and entertained and focused is really the biggest part of my job. Um, most of them, it, it's strange, and I'm speaking about them generically, obviously. It's a range of people, you know, from 18-year-old kids to people with families. And, uh, but most of them are so passionate about the quality of the product that I have to stop them from working too much, mm -hmm. right? My challenge is not trying to convince them to get more excited about Gears of War 3. My challenge is usually how to get them to stop being so excited because it's not going to ship for another year and a half. Mind you, this is a while ago. It's going to ship within a year and a half, internet, don't worry. Uh, uh, because we, yeah, we, we have to pace it, right? Uh, because folks really will stay up till 2 in the morning. We kick people out of the office at night and say, go home, because you can't keep doing this and sustain this for possibly a three-year development cycle. Um, so, so for us, I mean, uh, jello shaking, I think it's uh, a metaphor we borrowed from a Microsoft engineer about when we pace throughout this entire project of thinking, Pace yourself, do something sustainable. You've got to be able to do this again next week, so you can't kill yourself for every single demo, every single deadline, every single show. And there's a point at which we just say, all right, screw it, kill yourselves, right? That's at the <laughs> end, it's three, four weeks left, and you know, that's the, if it doesn't get in now, it's never going to get in, and you're always going to wish you did it. And that's when we kind of let everybody go and sprint, but until then, it's the marathon. It's the marathon. And, then we, and then we switch to the sprint at the end. And, uh, and, the, and the, best, the best teams that I've seen have those challenges. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, the best teams I've seen are the crazily passionate types where you are struggling to kick them out the door. Mm -hmm. You are struggling to essentially make them take some vacation because they care so deeply and will go to the wall to make something truly amazing. Yeah, I got my every two week mail that sends the vacation list of all my reports because people weren't taking vacation and we need to make sure they are taking vacation and taking time and regenerating. We're in a creative industry mm -hmm. and you have to get rest to be creative. You can't program 16 hours a day. You just break stuff, right? Uh, so it's really important for people to be well rested and energized. And it's, a, it's kind of a completely different set of problems that, that I get That's to right. deal with. That's why I wanted to bring it out because I think it's, you know, on the HR side of things and on the talent side of things that Jim was bringing up. Creative talent runs on a different fuel source. Ho-hos and jello you know, <laughs> and margaritas, obviously. <laughs> yeah. but, but there's also this kind of, you know, the, the, you need that regeneration. You use that term. Like Absolutely. So, I mean, and, it's I a, and it's a wonderful thing about the industry. It's, we've talked a lot about right brain throughout the day today. I love it for the fact that it's, it's a fantastic blend of, of right and left. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, one of my favorite things to do is to uh, walk around the floor and pop into my favorite artist and just ask him, show me something cool. Yeah, and it's just you know the pride comes through, and you see something mind-blowingly cool. Want well, to make your job fun, right? It's like I got Absolutely. that guy here. That's what he did. I'm making a difference. Yeah. I'm influencing this product that is so cool that I want to play. And, at some and point. Tony, you were, you were scratching on it. I, I think just a, a minute or two ago, ongoing tension, and I am a fan of healthy tension, not dysfunctional tension, but healthy tension. There's an ongoing healthy tension and, and kind of trade-offs between cost time and quality. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, not an epiphany uh, for any industry, but it definitely plays out in ours when you've got the pressure of hitting a launch window where, hey, we need Need for Speed to be hitting the street in time for the US Thanksgiving season and Christmas buying cycle. But at the same time, we want that, uh, that game to come in at a 85 plus Metacritic rating. Are we going to have to double down on some engineers to polish that game in the last two months and just ongoing tension and trade-offs between those three, cost, quality, and time? Yeah, for, for me as an independent developer, our history at Epic has always been the screw time, who cares, mm -hmm. right? Which we're really lucky to be able to do, and you, and you build quite a, a fan base from that of saying, we think it's going to be ready in a month, a month goes by, you know what? It's still not good enough. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep spending on this game until it is exactly where we want it to be. And in the olden days of video games, and olden days being 10 years ago, uh, you could pull that off. But now when you're talking about a $45, $50 million marketing budget and a major TV buy, it turns out you can't just move TV buys around whenever you want to, yeah. right? You've <laughs> actually got to have retailers knowing your game's going to come and making shelf space for it. And all this stuff that we never used to worry about in the video games industry because we were kind of cowboys, a bunch of garage studios basically that had sort of grown up. And now it's, we need to call our shot, point to the field and say yes, it's six months and three days from now it's going to be there and it's going to be great. Because mm -hmm. as soon as you make one bad game, you're done in this industry, right? Maybe I get two because I have two lines of business, but uh, 
you, yeah. I think you nailed it exactly right, is finding that quality and still hitting it on date is really important. And, and therein lies some more healthy tension even between uh, an EA and an Epic. So EA publishes and distributes and also creates. So, so we do create a, a decent piece of our, of our own new IP. Uh, but we publish a lot of games, and we'll be, we'll be publishing one from Epic, and uh, trust me, the, the folks in our organization that are working with partners, the last phone call they ever want to get is, oh, well, the date's going to slip out a couple of weeks, and uh, we need more money. <laughs> Health, healthy tension. We may have had that conversation with EA once or twice, <laughs> but it's shipping Tuesday on time, as far as I know. It's in trucks all over the world, so we're good. So, so let me open up. Let me open it up and see what questions you have now, because I'd like to get into some more of the nuances of distro and then you know form factors and everything else. But let's see what what's percolating out there. You um, have a very distinct talent pool that you are that you need to sustain your product. How do you actually go about finding those niche type of people? Because it seems like a needle on a haystack. I've got a magic decoder ring <laughs> and x-ray vision. Um, gosh, all types of means and mechanisms. I would say this. I would say that the, the age-old mechanism of um, friendship, um, nepotism, um, <laughs> bribery, and, and uh, leveraging relationships. I, so what am I really saying? Referrals. A heck of a lot of that, no doubt about it, because the gaming community is a, a, a fairly tight community and folks know each other. Uh, so we definitely leverage that a lot. No offense to uh, some of my brethren in the, in the movie industry, but we've done our fair share of poaching from that neck of the woods. So you know, even in uh, the black box studio up in Vancouver that's working on uh, Need for Speed, a racing driving game, there's a couple of Academy Award winners working on that game on the visual side and on the uh, audio side. Yeah, from, from our side, uh, we've tried to seed the industry. Um, uh, we, we start young. Uh, with the Unreal games, we always put out an editor that folks could try at home and mess around with making their own content for our games. In fact, our very first product, ZZT, was a text editor that sort of morphed into a video game at some point, and the editor went out with it, and that was about 20 years ago. So we've always put our tools out there, which is a really great way to see talent. We've run you know, big million dollar contests with Intel for who makes the best uh, uh, quality content with our tools. And then, of course, we put our tools in studios like yours and many others, and so it's a great way to see who's doing smart things with our tools. So we look a lot to the community, and we found a lot of folks, you know, the 16-year-old kid in Germany making cool content that we find a way to get here somehow. And uh, you know, my best graphics engineer is homeschooled from Iowa. Uh, you know, it's people who are making really cool t content on the net. I care a lot more about I show my passion by making some video games than I have a degree from an Ivy League institution. And, and just to give a little more context, you know, in terms of the type of employees, you know, I think your average age demographically is below 30, oh, yeah, kind of high 20s. Mm -hmm. EAs, I think when I joined, was about 29. These days it's 30, 31. And you've got to keep in mind there's crusty guys like me that are dragging that average up. So very, very young. To, to follow on your question around talent and you know, tapping into them, that's one aspect. I, I tend to focus more on how do we keep them and keep them engaged and keep them wanting to, to bring that discretionary effort and that's where I would, uh, you know, paint a picture of we've had a real opportunity to lay down a new set of rules in terms of the workplace, in large part because it is a new industry, mm -hmm. relatively new, and populated by a very young demographic. So if you were to walk around any of the studios I look after, you would feel that. So, you know, key aspects of the workplace that are quote unquote leading edge for established industries are par for the course in our industry. I am grossly overdressed yeah. today. Oh yeah. You complain. Exceedingly so. I mean it is jeans, ripped jeans and running shoes five days a week. It is bring your dog to work day every day of the week. I won't talk too much about the beer fridges and the like, but wink wink, nudge nudge, say no more. All of those sorts of things are, are key and really a, a baseline expectation. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what makes it very interesting having had the chance to visit, and, you know, cab rides home from parties and this type of thing. It's, it's a very different, different uh, environment, but it, it's so creatively driven. So, you know, on your side, you're, you know, there's a shareholder accountability, there's managing distro, there's all this, and then there's uh, narrowing your portfolio to where now, wow, we're really just placing a couple of bets. When we heard the same thing in movies, right, Larry? Like, we're, we're, we're getting less of them now. So that means risk goes up. Yep. Um, and our flexibility needs to go up as well. So I am seeing some parallels to what we've seen in terms of the benefits that companies offer. I think you've seen a, a lot of organizations get more flexible in terms of their realm of, of benefits and, and almost move to more of a cafeteria type of plan where you can pick and choose what makes sense for you and your family situation and everything else. I'm seeing the same sort of thing happen uh, beyond benefits and just in the realm of compensation, right? So, you know, are you uh, someone with uh, a spouse and kids where uh, a dependable base salary is more important to you? Well, maybe we tweak it more to that end of the spectrum versus a young blood 18 year old where it's like, hey, you know, you can pay me in slices of cheese, but give me a great big upside equity stake. Mm -hmm. And you know, really trying to, to customize that to the individual and, and what their needs are. John? Speakers allowed to ask questions. No, <laughs> sure. Easy um, questions. As long as it's not about data. No, it's <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> um, big fan first off, both companies. Thank you. Uh, the how are you guys looking at cloud gaming? You know, we, we spoke about mm -hmm. Quorum before, but you know, to again be immersed in a world that's constantly evolving and changing, being able to customize your character to make it more representative of you or who you want to be in those types of things. How are you guys starting to look at that whole you know, big franchises that are out there and what's coming down the pipe? Star Wars is going to have their own world. God help me, I might never come back. <laughs> I, I hope so. How are you guys looking at this stuff? Well, there's a bunch of different questions in there. I'm trying to figure out which one's easy and fun to answer. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to talk much about social games because we do exactly the opposite thing. Um, those mostly aren't games anyway. Um, they're, they're shared compulsion mechanics and reciprocity toys, right? They're not games. Um, so that's not exactly what we do, and most of the people at Epic would quit if we ever tried to make one, right? So these guys are more about stories and really cool monsters and guns. So uh, as EA is agnostic. We'll, yeah, exactly. we'll do we it do all. everything, right? So, uh, you know, five years from now, maybe we'll all be doing that, but that's going to require a workforce change. So we are thinking a lot about what you're talking about in the free-to-play multiplayer space, um, getting games into people's hands early because the microtransaction model is so powerful and mm -hmm. so easy, it's shocking. We made our first game on iPhone, released it about two months ago, and as an afterthought, we added in the ability to buy some gold for your character to kind of speed things up. Basically for people with disposable money and not time who want to get further through this game, and the game's only a couple bucks. We have people who spent $250 on gold in a three or four dollar game. Yeah. And, and this is not a game that's designed for that, right? It's really easy to design a game where you're like, you're hitting the block every day, and oh, if I want to see the next story bit in Frontierville, I can wait till Saturday, or I can pay 10 cents. Oh, sure, I'll pay, why not? Well, this game isn't built like that at all. You don't even need it, and we're seeing that revenue is catching up to base sales. So yeah, we've, we've got a, a large team in Shanghai who's working on two different free-to-play games, completely free-to-play market, in uh, China and uh, in India as well, large growing gaming segments yeah. that w are not going to pay me $40, but will spend money on microtransactions, and so we're going to see how well that works for us. And especially places like China, uh, you know, just the, the volume is such that if you can get a, a thin slice, you're, you're doing all right, and uh, online games are, are quite established there, and, and then, you know, countries like uh, South Korea where it's unbelievably dialed up and, and Everyone's playing and playing in internet cafes. I think another thing that's interesting there that you both brought up and you know in our conversations, but at EA is uh, you might have the same game, but you could monetize it differently in different geographies. So, as you're saying in Asia, you're not going to get them to shuck out the forty or fifty bucks right up top, but you might get to that number through microtransactions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas here in the U.S., we might just be well, we're used to the Best Buy model, and we go and we put it down. So it's not only you have the same property. But now you're actually thinking about different models based on where you're going into geographically. And, and, we're, and we're seeing that with 
some of our big franchises. Uh, Need for Speed is a good example. There will still be um, you know, a, a large Need for Speed game launched each year, but on the side, we've launched Need for Speed World Online, which is a free to play. Um, and you've got a couple op options in terms of how you progress. So you can grind it out for hours and hours and build up points and reputation, or you can take a bit of a shortcut, shell out $3.99 and uh, get some of those points and, and level up quickly and providing those options for folks. And then even amongst the established console game, you know, the, the, the last Need for Speed we did as an example, you know, leveraging mobile and, and other vehicles where you can be uh, racing, you know, maybe Tony and I are amongst the same friend group and uh, I just beat his time on a track and he'll get a little alert onto his iPhone that says, na 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 na, <laughs> took you down buddy, you better get out there and uh, see what you can do because you're not so fast anymore. We love that. because this it's microtransaction carburetor that I stuck in my car that then I have to buy. There you <laughs> go. We're not time, to, time to We're power not up. Yeah. Let me, let me talk about one other, one other thing. Um, so, so like, you know, in, in the management world, if you buy into Hamel and Prahalad and stuff, it's like you got a core competence, you shrink around it. You know, I'm not in the packaging business. I'll outsource that to FedEx. But what I'm hearing here is you do content, you do distro. Yep. Right? You have an engine and you do content, and you argued for it, well, that's actually what's allowed me to kind of, you know, essentially stay true to my own vision and run my own shop. So, so is this counter? I mean, is it beneficial to be living all the way across the chain? Or do you see over time that, you know, power and energy is gonna move somewhere in the chain and the distribution side is gonna start hammering on the creative side? Or what's, what, how does this value chain parse itself out? Where does the power move or does it just still bounce around? Will you will you always be running an engine and a, and game or as you look at that as a portfolio? What are you thinking? I, I hope to always be making an engine as well as games, and I hope that the power always resides with the original creator. But we'll see. <laughs> uh, you know, in our business, uh, there's always been a pretty clear line between the development creative team and then the publisher who handles distribution, marketing, and generally testing, localization services to multiple languages, that sort of thing. Um, two of those are really easy for me to do and outsource, and two are really impossibly difficult. Marketing, spending a $40 million marketing budget on some outsource team, it's possible, it's really dangerous, right? Yeah. You want somebody who's really invested in your product. And the other is distribution. And EA has a massive distribution chain in 27 countries, I'm not sure how many. I don't have least, the time yeah. or ability to do that. And most importantly to me, they've got a distribution chain they need to keep filled or else it starts breaking. And so they've got economies of scale that I get to take advantage of mm. in distribution. Um, soon, of course, that's not gonna be a real business because there's only gonna be digital distribution. I cannot wait. And then that's one of the four big reasons I needed a publisher gone and the other two are outsourcing all that's left is marketing. And then at that point, we look for marketing partners as opposed to publishing partners, I'd say. What about on your end, Brett? So, so he just said you, you guys are heading towards distro, but yeah. you've got you, well, I mean, you're acquiring IP. You're, yeah. You've got black box. Sure. We're gonna, how, does, how does a business leader like Riccatello look at this? We're gonna we want to fill the portfolio with with the best offerings possible. So, I mean, it's an interesting trade off even with Epic because there was a new IP being worked on at one of the studios I look look after that got shelved. Mm. And internally, it got, internally, it, it got shelved internally because we felt these guys would build a better game that would fill that piece in the, in the portfolio. Mm. So, and the, you know, those are some of the, some of the trade-offs that, that play out. The, the other hot sort of you know, buzzword, and it's been hot for several years, is just this online thing, right? Mm. Everyone's going online, what the heck does it mean? Within games, the way we look at it is, you know, kind of a, a three-legged stool. So online to me means distribution, so that's the obvious one, and trying to get more direct to the, to the consumer. It also means gameplay. So instead of just being a single player enjoying a game, if you've got phenomenal multiplayer online features, it makes for a much more robust and social experience. The third leg on, on the stool, I would say, is, is online as it pertains to community. And this especially holds true for the Bioware part of the business, which has an incredible fan base. And you know, I see a future where we're tapping into that fan base more and more and getting into areas of, of what we call UCC and UGC, which is user-created content, user-generated content. 
That may paint a bit of a picture in terms of where engines go in the future, because mm -hmm. if I was to take out my crystal ball, I, I think engines will need to become more open and more accessible as we get our communities becoming more involved. And dare I say it, I think some of our communities may very well become developers. Mm. So a need for speed game as an example. I, you know, I foresee a world, and I, I don't think it's that far around the corner, where you as a, as a user are able to create your favorite drive. And maybe it's the you know, Blue Ridge Expressway or something, but the, the tools are in your hands such that you know, with, with our technology and maybe a smattering of Google Earth and some other goodies, you're able to create and model out your favorite drive or downtown Shanghai and upload that, share it, et cetera. What do you think about that? Absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah. that's how we built our business around user-generated content. Mm -hmm. You know, Unreal Tournament, one of our fighter games shipped with 30-ish uh, arenas. And then, you know, within six months, there's another 3,000 online, and the most popular ones often came from the community uh, because the servers are being run by the community, the levels are being created by the community. We start the game, and then everybody it else takes makes on it their own. Right? Our engine is highly modifiable purposefully so that end users can make rocket launchers that shoot 50 at a time. It's not fun, but it's cool, and they got to do it themselves, <laughs> right? And they've got an investment into the product then. And then they can start their 50 rockets at a time server and bring everybody on. And uh, uh, for us, we, we've actually been so deep into user-created content that we've had to find ways to pull back and sort of own our brand. Yeah. So that you don't go online and say, well, let's see if this game is any fun. Holy shit, that rocket launcher was stupid. That's ridiculous. Who, who made this dumb game, right? And then they blame me for content that was user-created that isn't fun. Right. So like trying to set, you know, this is the gold standard. This is user-created community. So I'd say, yeah, we're very deep into user-generated content. Question. Uh, thanks for coming first, and uh, uh, my, question, coming. my question is regarding the, the time of development. You're saying that it takes more than two years to develop a game, and how do you, how do you, how do you, how's your decision making process in terms of which games are going to be developed in terms of, uh, I don't know, risk about who's, who's going to come first to market, maybe you have an idea and your, and your competitor puts it in the market first. So that's why we, we, we tend to see a lot of sequels, like because we saw it like Biomass 3 and Mass Effect 3. So uh, how, how do you do, how, how this decision-making process occurs? Uh, well, so something I, I heard from one of the top magazines in the games industry when I was trying to get coverage for a brand new intellectual property was, is it a sequel? Does it have boobs? Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so now pretty much I only make fake sequels with women in them. Um, uh, so I don't know, do you have a real answer for this question? This is a really, really hard problem. Oh, the other is that when I look at the competitive landscape, I look exactly where everyone says they're going to be and then I aim for it because no one ever hits anywhere close to what they say they're going to do. The easiest way to not ship when Halo is going to ship is aim when everybody says Halo is going to ship. Once, once they really commit publicly, they're right. But when people are guessing, it's always wrong. People slip all the time in our industry. More than half of software projects sh slip, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely more than half of video game projects because it's creative and research at the same time. So uh, I don't know how you guys actually pick between a large portfolio of products. Yeah. So it's very different. Well, I think, I think more than anything, we, we try to stay close to our customers and consumers because that's going to guide us and, and govern what, you know, what we think they're going to like and is going to be hot. Uh, I think we also try to be smart about leveraging IP. Um, so, you know, Mass Effect, as an example, a wonderful concept, very robust storyline. You know, we're, we're essentially playing that out as a, as a, as a trilogy. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I got there. Okay. Um, it strikes me that Oh, I'm something else jumped to mind. Okay, Sorry, there it was. There it was. Uh, Did you need a sock well, the, yeah. <laughs> the other the other piece that that comes to play, and I and I heard it a lot from other folks today. Um, we don't look at an IP, and this is starting to change. We don't look at an IP as as just game anymore. Mm -hmm. So the transmedia opportunities really come into it, and so there are you know a lot more possibilities around movies, graphic novels. I mean, even in some of the games we've done with Bioware, I, 
I was blown away by you know, the extra gravy we were, we were able to make from action figures, mm -hmm. as an example. Um, so we do, we do look at that more and more. And within EA, of course, uh, homegrown IP is generally going to be preferred if we can get it out on time to decent cost and quality because our margins are going to be better. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not uh, mm -hmm. paying a developer or we're not paying licensing fees like we do for a Madden, as an example, which sells phenomenally well, but the margins on that aren't going to be the same as, as something homegrown. Well, I was thinking about that, the Madden thing on the sports side, when we were talking about last night, and then you talked about you know, Batman and Batman Returns on Superman. With those sequels, it's like, oh, cool, you know, they just traded so and so to the Heat. So now, when NBA 11 comes out, are you, you're running on an engine, so now you just take this avatar that has all the capability of Kobe Bryant and he's moved somewhere. Um, slow it down. Is a it bit. a gift that keeps on giving? <laughs> In other words, is it easy to slow them down? But is it um, so? Even though you have to give rights back to to NBA and so on and so forth, is it, is it is it still a pretty good franchise? In other words, does it hit diminishing returns like you know the seventh movie, the six yeah. Star Wars I made, I sat through with my kid and so on and so forth. But that's like an exception on a rule. But every year there's FIFA and there's right. So how does I that mean, work? As, as, a, like, as a rule, we, we wouldn't be doing it if if you were making if, cash. If the margins, I'm just wondering are they, there. How are they? I, I think some of the things we, we look to do to, to kind of preserve and increase margins and increase the tail mm -hmm. on our games takes us back to online again. So as an example, FIFA or a Madden, um, you'll see with those games uh, really dynamic statistics. So if oh. someone gets traded, that's reflected in game. And if someone's going into a slump, that's reflected I see. in oh, game. Okay. Back to data. And then, the, and then the other piece you see with, uh, with some of those franchises, like a, a FIFA or a Madden, are online offshoots of those games. So for FIFA, as an example, you can create your own FIFA Ultimate Team. Oh, like trade, trade players, et cetera. Yeah. Question here? Yeah, to kind of touch on what you mentioned, um, I, was, I worked at Tiburon at EA on the Madden team. And if you do nothing but do a roster update every year, your customer is only going to buy the product every two or three years. Mm -hmm. By really trying to sell the features on a yearly basis, you want them buying on a yearly. And so that's been a challenge, is trying to get that behavior moving from every three years to an every year. And they kind of have discovered that through the data and through analysis. And the FIFA Ultimate Team, the Man Ultimate Team, yep. these are kind of online card games for microtransaction. They've really, really expanded on this and been able to make that revenue more regular. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So yeah, you can't just ship a roster update every year, that's why. Just yeah, I mean, that's, it's a business we were all very jealous of, the sports business being able to ship every year. Um, we actually tried it with the Unreal Tournament franchise. We tried going to a yearly release, and we made two, and we just couldn't keep it up. We couldn't get something new all the time. And the worst thing about the video games industry, because your tail is so long, you know, Madden 2008 does not sell in 2009. That's okay, because you shipped Madden 2009. But for us, we shipped Unreal Tournament 2004, and by 2005, it looks like yesterday's news, even though it's one of the latest, newest video games on the shelves. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm really jealous of the ability. To, just roster updates is pretty good, man. I mean, like, <laughs> I would take that business of only being able to sell it every couple of years with just roster updates. And then, of course, they innovate as well in the control schemes and that sort of thing. Yeah, and, and, and I would say, you know, the, the reason we're able to pump out a Madden each year or an NHL each year, those franchises are quite different than a new IP. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, as a rule, your hockey, your hockey arenas are not going to change. Your football fields are not going to change. So you've got those aspects that are established. And then what we're trying to focus on each year is, all right, what are the two, three big, mind-blowing, groundbreaking innovations that we can make happen inside a year? And you know, as a rule, games take longer than a year. These ones we're able to do because there's fewer variables and the teams are pretty sizable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the rest of the business for sequels, it's actually pretty nasty. Uh, for Gears of War, we doubled our scope of the game in terms of length of play, about tripled the amount of different options we had online. Uh, the quality overall, the bar was significantly higher, and we reviewed overall less. Um, and that's because the expectations were, oh, well, I mean, you're starting from this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that very much happens in our business, that the next sequel needs to be 20 hours longer in order to get the same number of sales and same rating. 
Uh, so it's, it's, it's funny because you need that sequel because you've got some guaranteed sales in your, in your fan base, but you have to blow them away again, and that's really tough to do, and I think that's what you're talking about. You can't just come back out with the same game with some twists. Right. It's gotta be, we completely changed quarterback control for the 15th time in the Madden series, right? How many times has the quarterback control <laughs> system been completely changed? But you've gotta have it, and you've gotta try the new quarterback vision or whatever it is. One last quick one then. Um, another conversation we were having is, when you get into the console business, and now the consoles themselves are, you got Kinect, right? You got Microsoft going with just no accelerometer, it's just reading your body, and then you got the others going in different directions. So now there's more degrees of freedom further down the distribution channel, and how does that parse back into design? So at one point in time you said you write the game once and then you just transcode it onto those platforms and they all work, but now there's more degrees of freedom further down. Does this become a logistical hassle in how Absolutely. you manage all that? Absolutely, huge logistical hassle, especially if, you know, if I told the truth to you when I said we were agnostic as it pertains to platforms, and I did, um, there's more and more platforms out there. Mm -hmm. So you know, a, a real challenge in terms of preserving that quality and hitting the date and hitting the cost on and, multiple platforms. On multiple so platforms. Similar to what we heard earlier with Jim yep. and others, same, same issues. Yeah, I mean, substantive differences between platforms um, is fun for the end user, but uh, you can't take the same game and just slap them between them anymore, right? Yep. I mean, the difference between an iPhone and a PlayStation P PlayStation 2 that just came out, or we, they just showed it a few weeks ago, you have sliding on the back now. Yep. How do you take a game that slides on the back and on the front and map it to an iPhone? You can't. How do I take a swipe game like this and map it to connect? Well, that's not so hard, because you literally swipe in the air, and we've done some things like that, but how do you map it to a controller? You can't, right? right? So taking that same IP and taking a game like our Gears of War and saying, let's do a connect version, let's do an iPhone version, it's a completely different game. Exactly. Just due to control scheme, regardless of the fact that you reduce polygon count or whatever. We're, we can do that. We've been doing it in the PC industry for 20 years. The difference between PCs, most people have, is maybe 100 times or more in power. But going across control schemes is nigh impossible. So you either get a dumbed down lowest common denominator product in the actual that works plan. on everything, in the yeah. gameplay that Which works that, on everything. You don't, it's only got one button, works great on Android, <laughs> right? Um, or We're back to Pong now. Yeah, exactly, my Blackberry can handle this just fine even though it doesn't allow multi-touch, right? Or you build something special for every different platform and can you do that in a high quality way on all platforms? It's really difficult. Of course EA can't, but I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Your problem, bro. Yeah. Any last questions for our August? panel, our sock puppet panel. Here, over here. In the back. Sock puppet, yeah. Hello. Um, <laughs> I would be interested in your opinion about new distribution channels. You see some um, interesting technologies such as the ones on live users. And uh, they're interesting because they could solve some problems you guys have like privacy and uh, the hardware costs customers face and the logistics you, you spoke about. So you think those technologies will kind of quickly evolve in the next years, or is it just a, just a slow hype? What? I, I yeah. think they'll continue to evolve, for sure, and I, and I, I think it's interesting. I think Xbox Live and, uh, and PSN are also really interesting vehicles for organizations like EA and others to try some new stuff out mm -hmm. as well. Like, it, it is, to the earlier question on new IP and where it comes from, it's, it's a, an excellent test bed to try out a mini game, see what sort of response we get, and then make the call as to, as to whether we go big and do a full-fledged production on it. Uh, we were one of the first to get in on the OnLive project. You know, we talked to those guys long before they came out. As a technology provider, we tend to work with platform holders and distribution, uh, let's say, technologies early on, because if they can make it work for our tech, then Mass Effect kind of works for free, that sort of thing. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad to see that happen. It gets past the, the last mile of if you don't have a fast computer, you can't play it. Seeing Unreal Tournament uh, pop up on a machine by pushing a button and it starts two seconds later instead of installing off of three DVDs or whatever, really nice, I like that. Um, I don't wanna get into um, physics theory, but the 120 millisecond time it takes to cross the country with the speed of light isn't going to be reduced at any time by on live. So I don't expect that it's gonna make a giant difference in many types of multiplayer gaming where that's not acceptable level of lag. Uh, so I think that's gonna be a challenge. If you remember that really great slide that was showing where the movie revenue comes from, and the little tiny one way over on the right, which was this is how much money we get when we air it on NBC four years later, that's what the revenue model looks like for us on live, 
right? Because it's bundling 500 games and they pay a $15 a month subscription service and how much of that is going to the developer? Not very much. So that's not nearly as exciting to me as direct to customer digital arrangements uh, like Steam or direct to drive or any of those. And then I just want to reference two themes that I've heard loud and clear throughout the day and they definitely play in our neck of the woods. One is this beloved term of agility or nimbleness. I like that. Nimbleosity. You nimbleosity. need you need nimbleosity with a capital with a, with N. A seed. <laughs> velocity. Get it? Velocity. Uh, so so uh, agility, nimbleosity, absolutely critical in our, in in our business, no doubt about it. The other one that is becoming increasingly critical, and I, I heard it throughout the day, stats are sexy. Mm -hmm. So analytics and telemetry is probably one of the hottest skill sets that I'm looking at and sourcing for these days. And it ties directly to the move online or plays in MMO type games because that's all about launching a live service. I mean, essentially, you're running a club. And if that club's not booking great artists and staying hip and sexy, it's, it's going to close fast. And so our ability to turn data into knowledge in, in real time and then reflect that in our offerings to the consumer, essential and only going to become more important. Yeah, I mean, by far the most popular video games right now, uh, though I don't like to refer to them all as such, the farm bills and city bills, it's all about analytics. That's mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're leveraging a customer base, moving them through their next product. It's not about game design and entertainment. It's about analytics and noticing that pink sells and tomorrow it doesn't and responding within a day. And I can't do that with our games. I can't do that with our services. When I put a product on shelves every three years, God knows what people want to do three years from now. But they can do same day, change it. Hey, everybody loves shotguns today. Let's do 10 shotguns and get them out tomorrow. It takes me six weeks to do a shotgun, right? I can't, I can't respond that way in my space, but I totally agree that's what whereas, whereas something like Need for Speed World Online, which is you know, an, an early foray, they had several offerings that they thought folks would spend 99 cents on. And they did on some of the things. But what surprised them was, whoa, there's a whole bunch of people that actually wanted to get more than one car, more than two cars. The Ferrari nut wanted to buy five Ferraris and have them tuned differently in his garage. Nice. Make no mistake, we had that offering in game mm -hmm. like yeah, that. You perfect. can buy as many cars as you want now. Good for you guys. So, um, the bit witching hour is upon us, but something that strikes me, you know, taking it back to business is you've got um, an employee base that you basically have to tell, go away and get some rest. I mean, these people are, t talent, opportunity, and passion converge, and they're frothing at the mouth. And you've got a consumer base that's going to let you know. Oh, yes. Real clear, either whether it's real-time data or through Metacritic and so on and so forth, whether or not you've actually achieved it on uh, on version three our, of your respective games. Our Star Wars fan base is already letting us They're know. They're just foaming. <laughs> and we haven't watched the game yet. It's like yeah. Michelangelo, when I'm ready. Um, so in business you say, well that's awesome. You know, you got, you've got a rabid uh, uh, consumer base and you've got just, you know, die-hard workers. But at the same time, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the middle uh, where we have to lead and manage differently. And that's why we wanted to end on the gaming because I think it kind of culminates, you know, they're new and it's emerging and it's in entertainment and media. And if you stand on the outside and you just look, well, this is great. You know, but at the same time, there's a lot of complexity in how the experience that they're going to have in 11 when your, when your games come out actually reifies itself through the, the, the same set of issues that Howard and others brought up in terms of how you move through the chain. So I appreciate you all being our anchor team. Thank you all very much. OK. So, um, my, my, my job is to close this now, and uh, in order to do that, I'm going to, you know, I'm a big fan of evaluation, so um, I said I had one goal at the beginning of this. Well, the first goal was to kick this thing off. Thank you all for being part of CTEM's uh, inauguration. And the second is, oh, can I get my screen up? My mind is a raging torrent flooded with rivulets of thought cascading into a waterfall of creative alternatives. Hopefully, you're feeling a bit more like that. Or, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're confused at a higher level about more important things. Either way, I don't think it would be possible to have sat through this day without developing a deeper appreciation through Immersion Day. And it's, 
it happened because of you. And you know, as executive director and on, on Mina's behalf, we can't thank you enough for being here, for sharing your knowledge, and for helping us launch this thing. So go forth and prosper. Thank you all very, very much. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.